Okay, so let's get started. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again from the DAC Forum uh, to this third webinar now in the series that we are running this year about the new wireless technology DEC 10R Plus. My name is Rul Ottink and I work for the DEC Forum and I will be the host for this meeting today again. Uh, before we get started, I can just say that we're very pleased to see the ho uh, high number of people re registered, uh, around 400, and we have right now uh, 141 people who have called in. Um, we're very pleased about that. And today uh, we have the first of two sessions in the webinar series that are dedicated to explaining the DEC 10R Plus uh, technology. Uh, and today we will start uh, looking into the upper layers of the technology and then in the next session on the 19th of October we'll present the lower layers. Today we have one speaker and that is Juho Pishkanen from company Wirepass. Juho is principal system engineer there and he has been active in NCTC DECT for several years uh, with development of the NR Plus standard and technology and he is one of the major contributors to this work. If we go to the next slide. And some notes again before the meeting. This time, the presentations we expect will take around 40 minutes. And again, questions can be asked during the session if you use the questions button at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Uh, but if there are too many, um, then we will answer them after the session. And I'd like to make you aware of the fact that we have all these questions and answers listed on our FAQ page on the DECT Forum website and the link you can see here. The webinar will be recorded and made available to all the people who have registered. Go to the next slide. Right, and uh, just to reiterate, so the purpose with the webinars has been to provide uh, as much information as we can about uh, DECT NR Plus. Uh, and we, uh, in the second session, talked about the applications and use cases for NR Plus and also then made the connection to the features and benefits or the specific strengths uh, of DECT NR Plus that make it so suitable uh, you know, for these applications and use cases. And now we're going into the next step and explaining the technology foundation and, and why uh, we have these features and benefits in this technology. And we'll start then with the, uh, the upper layers. And uh, with that, I uh, hand over to Yuho. Thank you, Rohan. So uh, but what we are today covering. So today we are covering the upper layer radio protocols. Uh, we start from the system topologies and deployment uh, use cases, uh, how the uh, forming of the networks is happening, how the routing in mesh network is, is happening, uh, followed by the end-to-end -end protocol functions, link specific protocol functions and details of the channel access. And uh, this is now covering the radio protocols from uh, from the uh, Mac layer up to the, to the uh, physical uh, up to the application layer, and and uh, and then in the physical layer details and and more the performance values will be presented in the, in the next next webinar. But uh, hopefully with this presentation, this goes quite to the, uh, deep in the technical uh, level, but you get the understanding variety of of uh, uh, functionalities that we have and uh, and how those can be then used in in your uh, uh, use cases and in your potential applications and, and so forth and uh, uh, and so forth so let's start the, from the system topologies that this uh, deck 2020 uh, or uh, new radio standard or deck nr plus is supporting so uh, the first thing to understand uh, in the net system topologies is, is the network identification. So whether the system is a 
so the network is simple point-to-point -point radio connectivity, uh, two devices communicating each other, or, or this kind of star network where you have uh, one device uh, host uh, connecting the rest of the devices together and then and, and to the back end to the internet, or whether we have this kind of large network with different mesh, uh, mesh equipments. Uh, all networks are identified by using the 24-bit long network ID. So basically, that's the key which collects the, all the devices in the signal network. Uh, the design has been designed so that you can have multiple overlapping networks. So, so uh, Spectrum uh, uh, 1880 MHz to 1900 MHz in Europe, for example, the dedicated earmark for the tech, uh, Spectrum, you can use multiple networks overlapping each other and in other Spectrum even more. And uh, uh, you have more space, but yes, you can have multiple net networks on each other. And uh, the 24-bit uh, long network ID, we haven't yet uh, seen any need to ne uh, network ad uh, ID administration. So we can have approximately 16 million global unique networks. And in addition to this 24-bit uh, long network ID, we use 8-bit short network ID in physical layer uh, signaling uh, to identify different data from different networks so that the uh, devices can recognize fast the already in the physical layer whether this data is for is, is part of this network or, or part of the other networks. So that's the optimization in, in, in that sense. But when independently whether the system is point to point, star or mesh network it's all are possible with the technology, the network identification is done in a similar manner. Uh, then devices uh, identification in the system or in the single network uh, is done by 32-bit long radio device ID and, and the only requirement for the ID is that uh, it's a unique for the radio device in the network, so in the single network. So then you can have multiple networks reusing the same IDs, but uh, they are not causing any, any trouble. So, so at, at least the, uh, the, uh, the device in single network needs to have a unique, unique 32 bit ID. And this uh, uh, introduces a possibility to support uh, over or roughly 4 billion devices in the, in the single network. So that's the, giving us the possibility to introduce very large scale network. And uh, this long radio device ID is used for packet routing and identification of the in the MAC layer also of the devices. And then we have been uh, uh, defining special addresses for broadcasting messages in the system and also for the back end. So when data is sent to the back end, that can be identified with the special address value. And then set of addresses can be assigned for the multicast. So, so basically, out of these four, four billion values in the system configuration, you can say that these values are used for, for different multicast addresses. Uh, in addition to this 32-bit address, we are using 16-bit sort address, identifying other devices again in the physical layer. So this is enabling devices to detect that whether certain transmission uh, is for them in, inside that single network and whether uh, 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 and who was the uh, transmitter in that radio neighborhood. And this is then un, uh, uh, enabling fast identification of the packet so that you don't have to uh, decode unnecessary uh, transmissions uh, when you are receiving some transmissions which are not indented for, for, for the specific device. So this is the basic how the identification of the devices and, and the networks are, are done in the, in the system. Then if we think about the uh, network topologies, the, let's say the simplest of, of course is the is the point to point. But when we think about the uh, star network, we can see that, OK, we have two star networks uh, here in the example, basically one operating in one channel and actually one operating in the other channel. But basically, this is the for, uh, beginning of the formation of the mesh network. Uh, so basically, the mesh network is the cluster tree, the mesh network topology. Uh, 
uh, so that it starts to grow. So first we have a devices uh, which are Uh, providing the connectivity to the backend, uh, and then you have a, a radio devices connecting to that one, and then you have a devices providing the next hop connectivity towards the next uh, next uh, set of devices. Notable thing here is that the, each of these clusters can operate in different channels. And they are locally deciding. We have then uh, further going details on how they are. But basically, each channel or yeah, each cluster can uh, utilize different radio frequency channels, and they can be locally locally uh, selecting those. Also, the backend connectivity or the connectivity to the internet is uh, uh, independent from the radio technology. So it can be cellular, or it can be uh, LAN cable, or any other uh, data connectivity. Solution only requirement is that it's sufficiently capable so that the, all the data which the network is providing to the back end and uh, from the back end systems to the, to the network, the throughput of that connectivity is sufficient. And uh, you can increase the capacity by increasing more back end connectivity system, uh, connectivity points. So basically, the system reorganizes by itself when it's detected that there's new back end connectivity points and the cluster three is formulated again. So this basically increased the capacity of the system by just adding new backend connectivity points. Uh, and and this, it's also uh, increased, uh, can extend the network coverage. So basically, when you are adding new points in new areas, you get the devices connected to the, to the internet in that area or in the backend system in that area. Also, we have to understand that, that notable thing that uh, devices, for example, in this cluster three, uh, here in example, for example, this device here in the PT in the uh, top doesn't have to call, uh, hear or be able to uh, understand that uh, hear the radio signals from the device that is in the next hop here in the radio for providing the internet connectivity. It's only necessary that the uh, device, uh, router device in the, uh, is able to connect that one, and then it can con connect to the, to the next one. So, so basically the, uh, the uh, uh, connect, uh, uh, coverage of the system can organically grow uh, when devices are added in the system. Okay, and then uh, if we look at the operating mode of the devices, so basically we have a, a two modes, all the radio devices can have two modes. Uh, they are operating in a radio device in FT mode. So the FT mode is the device that controls radio resources in that cluster and routes the data. So basically, radio device in FT mode here in the picture is only operating in FT mode because the, all the data uh, which what is receiving is sending to the backend connectivity, and all the data what is receiving is pushing to its members. Uh, which, uh, 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 which are connected to it. Uh, then we have a radio devices in the PT mode, which are connecting uh, to this uh, next hop in the in the cluster. Uh, and uh, the radio device in the PT mode selects the best radio device uh, to connect, which are operating in the FT mode. And then we have a devices that can. Oh, basically operate simultaneously in both modes. So they are provide, uh, connecting in PT mode to the device in the FT mode, but at the same time they are providing the connectivity and uh, uh, controlling the cluster radio resources in, in, uh, in FT mode and providing the connectivity to the, uh, to the devices in uh, operating in the PT mode. And, and that way the number of hops can, can grow. Uh, and the uh, design is such uh, in physical and, and the Mac layer and in the whole design so that, uh, that the single hardware software uh, solution can support both modes. So this is a logical mode of the operation protocol functionality in the device. There's no hardware differences uh, between the devices operating the FT and PT mode. So, so the, all the uh, single uh, design 
of the devices uh, or hardware and, and software can support the, uh, you can build a complete network of course the only difference here in the radio device FT mode that it needs to have the connectivity whatever internet uh, or, or backend connectivity solution is used to support that uh, radio or, or cable interface for example LAN cable or, or, or cellular connectivity but uh, that's a, like a specific specific for that that device that it has this external interfaces so this is the how the system is created uh, it provides the, the overall uh, uh, like possibility to create the devices operating in in, in single mode uh, like a point-to-point -point radio single star network or in this kind of large mesh network and we can look a little bit on the on the routing in mesh network which is quite interesting topic uh, so basically in the routing uh, as i said the routing operates with the long radio device ids uh, we have a separate source and destination addresses in the in the routing uh, basically the system provides single hop system for applications including ipv6 so whether the device is uh, connected next to the internet point uh, the target device of the data or the source of the device or whether it's multiple mul behind multiple hops it's from the application point of view and, and from the ipv6 point of view looks like a single hop network we have three different routing methods we have the uplink traffic so device uh, data from the device to the backend we have a downlink direction so basically data from internet and backend to the to the uh, to the device or then locally inside the local environment uh, sending data between between different devices we don't uh, have any mesh coordinator or single point of failure in the system in that sense such there's no no need to, uh, for those uh, if if one of the internet connect uh, radio devices ft modes with internet connectivity uh, fails to operate for example internet connectivity fails uh, devices can connect to the next uh, radio device having, uh, having that internet connectivity and and uh, and therefore there's redundancy when when you have multiple radio devices uh, providing that internet connectivity we don't assume rate routing tables uh, at the moment in the specification so the routing is done without those and then when we look the uplink routing uh, the uplink routing is simply based on the cluster uh, three topology so the radio device sends the uplink data to the next hop so the device in the right for example sends to the next and and that forwards the data to the to the radio device having the internet connectivity and so forth in the, in the lower part of the figure and the sending radio device does not need to know the exact path it does only need to know the, who is the next hop best not the next hop who, who I who would set the data towards the towards the back end uh, the next hop selection is based on the minimum signal quality and the router cost so basically radio devices are evaluating the neighborhood and which uh, radio devices they are seeing uh, operating in FT mode and where they get the minimum signal quality and then where they get the lowest uh, router cost to the, to the back end and the radio devices are constantly doing a regular re-evaluation what is the best nest hop so that provides the capability to support mobility and uh, and different uh, environmental changes and then the cost calculation can take different aspects we have been leaving this a little bit uh, let's say open for different implementations uh, so basically the it has to increase constantly so the cost of the uh, 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 rotor cost has to increase per each hop at least by one but then implementation can take a look what kind of uh, how they increase it based on the load and based on the for example energy devices is having for example main power devices may reduce the, uh, they, they might provide a lower cost compared to the battery operated devices so that the traffic naturally is going more on the on the mains power devices compared to the battery operated devices 
and the, the uh, routing is heavily optimized for the, up, the uplink data, which is the heavily dominated in, in the MPC applications typically. So the amount of data that sensors and, and these kind of measurement systems are providing, typically the data is from uplink direction, more, more biased compared to the, to the other directions. Then we have a downlink routing, uh, which is based on restricted flooding. Uh, uh, basically, the radio device in FT mode the data to all members that are in the FT mode. So that it's, uh, of course, if it when it detects that the target of the data is the radio device uh, directly associated, it will send its data only for that device. But when it re uh, receives the data and the tar target is not there directly under it, it sends it to all routers that are, are there. And the distribution tree is pruned whenever possible. Uh, and then in the uh, local communication, uh, we have a method for flooding the in limited number of hops in the radio environment. Uh, and it, the data can be from one device to multicast group. And uh, this is targeted for the special use cases where the, low, the traffic is truly local, like the lightning control system or other similar kind of environment where the single device sends a single command for multiple multiple devices nearby. And uh, of course, the nearby means that, for example, it's the same office room or same small factory area in uh, and and or, or in the in the certain factory. But of course, this is not intended that the uh, device is sending a command directly to the next uh, 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 edge of the of the other side of the mesh network, which is other side of the city, or, or so forth. So, not not intended for large large applications in all that kind of deployments. But uh, we at the moment haven't seen the use cases for those. But uh, and uh, the beauty in some and benefits of this is that we can then develop further these different routing methods independently. So we can develop downlink routing, which is part of the uh, release two agenda at the moment, that we are improving that part. And then we can uh, uh, develop a radio device to the radio device communication uh, in the separate with the separate methods and separate optimization uh, points. This was the glance for the for the routing. Then we look at the protocols. Uh, so the protocol architecture, uh, well, it's a not that difficult, but uh, there's a few, few things. So basically, uh, we have a, if we start from the top, we have a CVC, which uh, 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 is a protocol convergence layer, uh, which is the providing set of services to the applications. And as you can see in the figure, the IPv6 is seen as an application from for the radio protocol point of view. We can support applications operating with IPv6 or uh, uh, without any IP at all. Well, IPv4 will also work, but uh, perhaps in the IoT world, for example, IPv6 is more, more interesting. So the CVG has set of services, including security, trans, uh, transmission service, and multiplexing services, which we look later. And these are end-to-end, -end. so from the original device to the end of the device. and then. In the DLC layer, we are, uh, which is the uh, data link control layer, we have a routing service and the DLC entities. And the DLC entities are, are link specific, and the routing service is basically the layer which makes the decision uh, between how to forward the data forward. And then we have a MAC and the physical layer uh, providing the actual transfer of the data. And then when we have a router device, the router, when it's forwarding packet from radio device one to radio device three, which is then having the backend connectivity to the to the uh, back to the uh, local or, or uh, global cloud, or or, uh, or or these services are terminated even in the gateway. Uh, the uh, middle device is only operating by Mac, uh, physical layer, Mac, DLC entities, and routing services. So the CVG functionality is not uh, activated for that device when the data is coming from the radio device one to radio device three. Of course, this device, radio device two, might um, has the CVG functionalities 
there for its own data, uh, but uh, when it's routing other devices' data, that's it's not existing. And the uh, final topic here to emphasize is that uh, the functionalities like security functionalities uh, providing end-to-end -end security in the CVC layer are defined so that uh, they can be implemented in the gateway uh, or, or in this FT device, which is having the backend connectivity. Uh, but uh, they can be also implemented in the backend. So the st uh, standard doesn't take uh, stand, and the, and the definitions are defined so that that kind of splitting of the functionalities can be done. So, so for example, end-to-end -end security can be truly end-to-end -end security from the device to the application uh, backend servers. Uh, if we look protocol architecture in star or single link uh, operation, uh, let's say the CVC layer functionalities remain the same, all the same functionalities can be used. DLC routing becomes trivial, so basically all the data is either for the radio device or from the, uh, 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 from the radio device or to radio device. So, and, and the radio, other radio device which is operating as a FT with the backend connectivity is basically forwarding data between backend and main device. But the rest of the DLC uh, services are there, except the routing, which is the trivial part, and then the Mac and physical layer are also exactly the same. Uh, then if we look at the, uh, these end-to-end -end, uh, protocol functions with more details, so the first function is the end-to-endpoint -end multiplexing function which is provides the means for multiplexing different application data with different data types in the single new radio network. Uh, and applications by, can be public or, or and public specification or company specific data. And each application can have own endpoint multiplexing address and that can be allocated and, and the allocation is done by, uh, by, uh, by Etsy. So there's a, a web page hosted by Etsy where, where companies, for example, can request company specific endpoints, or or then uh, the, let's say the use of uh, uh, public specification. Uh, what is the uh, endpoint value for the public specification is also addressed. There's also values that are free space, so you can also use it by yourself. But there's no guarantees that somebody else would also use it. Also. But this basically provides flexibility to have different application and data types within, with or without IPv6 in the same network. And also the CVG uh, functions like end-to-end -end security can be targeted for certain application. Not necessarily all the applications in the single network has to use the same, same uh, CVG functionality. And uh, in the CVG, uh, we have a following function. So the first function is in the transmission uh, part, we have this segmentation and reassembly. So basically that allows that the PDU sizes for routing can be optimized for the IoT systems so that the, the, uh, the application data size can be quite large. For example, the IPv6 MPU sizes can be supported. Uh, the minimum is roughly, uh, other Standard size is roughly 1,500 bytes, a bit less, but uh, roughly that, that magnitude. Uh, then we have an end-to-end re uh, retransmission scheme. So basically, it works on top of the MAC hybrid ARQ and the DLC retransmission schemes end-to-end, -end, which can ensure that whatever happens in the multi-hop chain or in the mesh network, the transmitter can ensure that receiver has received 100% uh, error freely all the data that it has been sending. Uh, and then we have uh, this security service that I was mentioning, uh, basically providing cyphering and integrity protection end to end from the source of the data to the back end or, or in the gateway, depending where, the, where that is implemented. But basically, over the, all the hops, the data is, uh, can be ciphered and, and integrated for the and as I said, all these functions can be enabled per endpoint, so basically on, on the application needs. So, and, and for example, this enables also that the different applications using uh, security 
can have different uh, security keys. So one application, one sensor set of sensors, for example, sending data, can use the end-to-end -end security, ciphering and end security protecting the data, but uh, then other service can be using uh, other, uh, other set of keys. And also the endpoints, as you saw in the previous figure, endpoints can target the data so that the gateway, uh, the FT mode to the backend is directing data to the different packets. So you can have multiple backends, even though uh, even in the single single network. So the, so the, and and the certain data goes to the certain backend and other goes to the other other backends. So we have a quite nice flexibility to support different applications in the same systems and different uh, like how data is consumed uh, in in different backends and and uh, in the end user the end user domain. Uh, then if we look at the data link layer, so now we are going from the end to end to the lower, uh, to the link specific and, and so forth. Well, the routing service is somewhat between. So basically the routing service uh, provides the decision making uh, on, the, on, on uh, how the, uh, where the forward the data based on the, uh, this uh, radio IDs, long radio IDs. It also provides uh, quality of service. Uh, so prioritizing uh, data between different uh, uh, priority, uh, different priorities when, when transmitting data forward. We have a cumulative delay, which can be used by the applications to calculate the end-to-end -end delay or the delay from the original source of the data to the destination. So for example, multiple sensors sending data to the back end uh, so, uh, with different uh, transfer delays backend can then calculate that okay uh, uh, so uh, that uh, what time instance each measurement was was done then we have a cumulative hop count which can be used especially with the hop limit to limit where for example the radio device to radio device routing is happening how many hops the data can be progressing so that you can limit for example that the command from the some sensor uh, turning on lights is only going certain distance and not going everywhere in the large uh, mesh network. Uh, and then in the DLC layer, we provide also the segmentation and reassembly for the Mac so that we can do it uh, efficiently on the physical layer. We have an ARQ operation so that the DLC entity can re-initiate retransmission re of the PDUs if it realized that, for example, the hybrid ARQ uh, retransmissions are not successful or the route, for example, has been changing and some of the PDUs needs to be transmitted. And same time, we have also the lifetime control so that if some PDUs are some reason not going through as fast as expected, those can be deleted, uh, reducing the overhead of the system. Okay, so now we are going to the Mac uh, side. Uh, so basically the Mac is then the key for uh, when we think about the data through uh, data uh, path, it's basically multiplexing all different data to the physical layer. Uh, so the Mac PDU contain, may contain uh, several types of data, uh, which is uh, integrity protected and, and also ciphered. And that data then goes to the PDC uh, part of the physical layer transmission. And, uh, and then in the next uh, webinar, we are presenting more on the, what is the, how the functionality of the physical layer is operated. And this is now, this, uh, ciphering is used in, in, the, in the Mac layer also, so that we have a link specific ciphering now. In the CVG layer, we had the end to end ciphering. Now we have to do the end, uh, link specific ciphering. And for here we use IS128 counter mode and uh, OMAC one message integrity protection. Actually, the same uh, algorithms are also provided in CVC layer to provide uh, the end-to-end -end security. Of course, keys are different. Uh, then, of course, the Mac makes the transmission parameter selection. So basically, how the transmissions should be done, what is the most optimum transmission mode for this transmission, and sets the header field bits in the, in the PCC. And then it operates with the physical layer uh, for error correction throughout the HARC. So basically sending 
ACNAC, uh, positive acknowledgement and negative acknowledgements to the, to the transmitter from the receiver side, and then initiating retransmissions from the transmitter side based on this uh, ACNAC information to, to retransmit the data. And then, of course, the physical layer makes the uh, combining of the previous and, and the new transmissions, but uh, more on that in the next webinar. And then we have a channel quality and buffer status reporting. So uh, for the link adaptation so that the transmitter can uh, optimize its own transmission formats for the for the report uh, for the for the transmissions and understand how much data there is still in the queue uh, going bit even more details in the physical layer so basically uh, going still back so the physical header field goes to the PCC part of the data. So the physical layer packet contains the STF, which is for synchronization. Then we have the physical header field, which is the how the data is transmitted and, and utilized for the HARC. And then we have the actual MAC PDU data in the PDC. And the GI in the figure is the card interval between different transmissions. So that's like an empty time in the air before, before new transmissions can start. But in the PCC, basically, uh, we have uh, two sizes. 40 bits uh, size is used for the beacon transmissions uh, and 80 bits for the data transmissions. And the physical layer is able to decode which, whenever it's receiving a transmission, which format of these is, is received. Uh, and the MAC control the transmissions by setting the length of the transmission, so the transmission Single transmission can be multiple subslots. Uh, each subslot with the, with the uh, smallest bandwidth is uh, 200 microseconds. So with the two, 200 microsecond granularity, we can uh, uh, control the transmission length. And, and that's, of course, impacts how many bits you are transmitting in single, single transmission. It sets the sort identities that I was talking earlier. So both receiver and transmitter IDs. Uh, what is the TX power? So we have a power control functionality in the Mac so that we optimize the transmission power so that we are not blasting with the full power always. We are optimizing for so that the receiver gets it in the correct uh, rece uh, reception level. We can select the modulation and coding. So there's many different uh, modulation up to uh, 1000 QM. I think uh, typical IoT devices we are seeing MCS1 to MCS4, which is the QPSK to uh, 16 QAM modulation to be used. We have MIMO possibilities, uh, perhaps not the IoT solutions, but in other type of applications, MIMO can be used. We have a hard control pitch, which is the redundant process numbers, redundancy versions, new data indicators, how the, how the new transmissions and, and the retransmissions are, are done. And then we have a feedback, which contains that uh, uh, ACNAC in information, buffer status, channel quality inf information in the CQI field and potentially if the MIMO is used, MIMO pre-coding and, and uh, rank information. So all that is coupled, uh, is tied inside the PCC uh, bits of the data transmission. And then going to the, uh, to the radio access part. So basically the whole uh, system behaves in such a manner that the radio devices in FT mode controls the radio resources in the cluster. So you saw in the beginning of the presentation, this mess figure, you have mu see multiple clusters. So each cluster is managing the radio resources independently by themselves. That's the basic and how that can grow the system. If we, if we would have a single control point, the scalability of the system would be limited. Now we don't have that kind of things. We have each cluster controlling its own radio resources. It can uh, grow and grow the number of uh, clusters in the system. Uh, so basically, the radio device in FT mode selects the radio operating channel, so the frequency where it operates, uh, starts sending network and cluster beacons, uh, and it may change the operating channel, of course. Otherwise, it would be completely fixed, but uh, based on the interference conditions and, and so, uh, so forth, it can decide that, oh, I need to change my channel because I can operate better in this channel because this has less interference or less other devices traffic. And uh, the network beacon basically provides possibility to search fast uh, other, other devices. So the network beacon is like a discovery 
of the uh, uh, clusters in the system. So everybody is transmitting network beacon on limited number of channels. And then they are pointing when they are transmitting actually the cluster beacon, which provides the information how this co uh, communication is this, in this cluster can operate. And they provide both the channel plus the timing, uh, timing of, the, of the cluster beacon. So when device, other device is detecting this network beacon, <coughs> it can directly know when the cluster beacon is being transmitted in there. So then, of course, the radio device in FT mode provides the connectivity for other devices to, to connect it. It contro controls the radio resources for the random access transmissions and scheduled, uh, schedules the dedicated radio resources for the uh, scheduled access and, and can operate sy uh, local synchronization with other FTs so that they can find other beacons, uh, cluster beacon transmission times so that the other uh, beacons are not colliding. Uh, in uh, inside the same frequency, or, or and and the and the transmission timings of the beacons are, are are sensible. And then in the devices in the PT mode, so basically they find the FTs and try to uh, measure uh, based on the scanning which are the best devices to connect uh, based on this minimum quality, link quality and the rotor cost. As I was explaining, in it says the association. <clears throat> and may reinitiate the association the next one when, when the conditions are changing. And then, of course, transmits on and receives on resources provided by the FT. So how the cluster is operating, the PT can then tra start transmitting data based on the configuration provided by the FT. Okay, a uh, few slides still to go. Uh, the first one is the run, uh, the first one is the random access. So the random access is the transmission mode that the PT uses to establish the association. It can be also used for the uh, sending the sporadic data. And uh, uh, as you saw the basic figure of the transmission, so you have the STF in the beginning, you have the PCC, and then you have the PDC for the data. The random access uses the exactly the same packet transmission format. Uh, and uh, basically, the random access works so that the FT is broadcasting resources where the random access is happening. So basically, it's indicating that I'm now listening to you. You can transmit with the random access message, uh, the type transmission for me. And uh, each device which is trying to transmit to the random access makes the LPT measurement before transmitting. So basically, there's a short uh, measurement or sensing period before transmitting. Uh, and if the transmission or the, uh, the device detects that the transmission is not busy or the media is not busy, it initiates the transmission. If it, but on the other hand, if it detects that the channel is busy, it takes the random back off and uh, uh, waits that random back off time before measuring the channel again. And when it's detected the channel to be free, it transmits. And if there's a collision detected uh, by the by the device, then the random access times uh, values are doubled every time, reducing the probability of the collision. And currently, the PC level in in the in the spec specification is depending on in in this DEC 2020. Uh, sorry, in the DEC core band 1880 to 1900 is dependent on the maximum TX power. Uh, and, uh, and for maximum DX power of 23 dpm, the PC level is minus 70, 75. So there's, if you are transmitting with the lower powers, you can use uh, slightly lower, lower uh, thresholds for, for the LPT. And of course, when we are then talking about potential other frequencies, other frequency bands, uh, these values can be slightly, slightly different. Uh, but anyhow, uh, this is how, how the transmission works uh, for the random access. And as said, this is the basic, uh, all the devices has to support this one uh, for the sending the connectivity, the first connect connection setup. Uh, and then the second mode of transmission is basically the scheduled transmission. So basically we have a few use cases listed here. You can in, uh, think about others. So basically real-time audio phone call where you have a very periodic transmissions, video transfer, industrial control logic, or then generic transfer of 
uh, low power IoT devices. And here the basic scheme is that the FT signals the transmission and reception resources to BT uh, side and, uh, and uh, transmission and uh, reception occurs in the periodic times. So for example, in here, in the figure, we could see that, okay, this is now going in the 10 millisecond frames. So every frame there is downlink reception and uplink uh, transmission moment, just for example. And then of course, how, this, how long this scheduled access happens is can be configured by the FT. So of course it can be taking like minutes or hours in case of video or audio call or only a few hundred milliseconds uh, uh, by, by for, the, for the IoT devices. And similarly, Clever FT and, uh, and the implementation can share the same resources between different, different PTs. So, so for example, the uh, device, uh, the FT can schedule so that the other device is transmitting every 20 millisecond and other device is transmitting every, uh, every 10 millisecond on the same resources or, or individually so that one, one downlink slot and one uplink slot is one, one, one device and then comes to the next device and so forth. So there's a flexibility for how to schedule this done. And now we are in the summary and the questions. So uh, in, in all, all together, before going to the question part, uh, the summary is that we have a radio technology, radio protocol la layers, which are flexible. We can do, uh, and it's all the way from the IP application to the physical layer, the protocol has been defined. Uh, we have a different architecture options uh, that we can support with the same, same design. Uh, and there's a link specific and end-to-end uh, -end functionalities. And uh, basic functionality is there. It's frequency independent and, and can operate on different, different frequency bands also. So now it's time for questions. So thank you very much, uh, Juho, for your comprehensive and, and detailed presentation. And uh, indeed, uh, it's time for questions, and we have received uh, quite a few. And um, let's get started with the first one. Um, does NR Plus support self-healing mesh? Uh, yes. So basically, if we go to the very beginning, I can try to explain. Uh, So if we think about the situation that the network is in this uh, environment, we have two gateways uh, and, uh, and the routers are there. So basically adding one gateway, you have or two gateways, you have a slightly different clusters and so forth. But of course, if the, for example, the internet connectivity or some of the devices, some reason fail, all other devices can take the, uh, start routing the other devices data. So there's no single point of failure in that sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question, is it possible to harm another's network in case someone by purpose or on, on purpose uses the same network ID? Well, uh, uh, so uh, of course, <laughs> Uh, well, that's a good question. Can you buy? I think something, these kind of things could be organized by Etsy if, if you really see desired so that you would have a network ID for your own. So there's 24, uh, sorry, 16 million IDs at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we haven't seen that, that strongly, a strong requirement, uh, but uh, in, in theory, that can be hosted by the Etsy, that kind of our case. But, uh, we are foreseeing that, uh, and we have been thinking the scenarios where you could have a, like a multi globally multiple locations operating with single network ID. Uh, but on the other hand, if we are, if we have one uh, DEC 2020 new radio or DEC NR plus uh, network in in here in Tampere, I wouldn't say that if somebody uses in San Francisco same network ID that wouldn't hurt. But of course, and second the security keys well if they are properly set they would be different so the data would not go fast but uh, 
but at the moment we haven't seen the requirement for uh, nailing the network IDs for, for certain, certain users only. But in theory, that would be possible. Okay, so you you uh, you uh, think that the the risk of uh, such a uh, you know, collision is extremely small, and therefore you haven't seen the need to. No, no, no right. yes, correct. But, so a question for me then: Is it possible to introduce this at, as a later stage, if any way there is, you know, it turns out there is a need for this? Yes, I think so. Then, then we would need to just force that there certain IDs would be for certain purpose only, mm -hmm. and those cannot be be used by by others. Okay, of course you have a, then like okay if that value, but that it's one of the, the sixteen million. So, right. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's go to the next question. So which is it, how many internet backup connections can you have in NR plus mesh? Uh, basically every device could have it if it, if it wants to have it, but that doesn't make too much sense, but, uh, but there's no limitation in that sense. So we have a, you can have as many you like. And, uh, and uh, we, we can envision the cases where, where the implementations are turning certain backends on when they, really need it and then they can turn those devices off and they don't need it so depends on on the use case but uh, there's no limitation mm -hmm. then i have a, a similar question but i don't think it's the same so can the mesh have multiple back ends and i think you, you actually presented that in one of the slides yes yes can have multiple no limits yeah okay and we go to another question does nr plus support uh, mobility leave move leaf uh, moving from one cluster to another cluster yes so basically the leaf node or the pt device is re-evaluating the what is the next or the best connectivity at that time moment and can any time associate to the next next device next device so it's like a, a radio device oriented mobility but uh, indeed yes it can Okay. Then, how is this discovery done in case a leaf from one cluster would like to connect to another cluster, which is working on a different fre frequency? So we have a basically we have two two methods of of uh, of discovering the neighbors. So the first uh, first thing uh, method is is doing by by detect, uh, by network scanning. So basically measuring the uh, and try uh, finding out the network from the or network finding network beacons. So basically scanning a radio environment. Uh, we have a, a specific, uh, uh, let's say, the different cl clusters can operate on different uh, channels, but then the network beacon can be sent on only on the limited set of channels. So scanning. But then we have actually in the Mac. I didn't go that detailed. But in the Mac, we have also the possibility that the radio uh, other routers, the radio devices in FT mode, are advertising uh, neighboring devices uh, by by the by the signaling. So they can also advertise possible neighbors in the radio neighborhood. And in that in that uh, uh, advertisement, uh, both frequency channel and the timing when the cluster beacon is transmitted by the other devices is, is, is provided. Okay, uh, now we have a very a different question. Do you know actually the power consumption of a routing device? So, uh, well, the routing device, of course, the power consumption uh, is depend highly dependent on, on the activity of the device. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and how how much data uh, it has to receive plus transmit, and then of course what are the link distances that it needs to transmit. So of course the radio device reception is consuming energy, and the transmission is consuming also. And in in the sparse environment, I would say that the uh, uh, and with a lot of data. The energy consumption can be quite high because you need to transmit potentially with the highest transmission powers and if you are transmitting 
with 23 EPM transmission powers, uh, the transmission energy is, is quite high. But uh, then it goes to the product design. And uh, uh, I think we, we will see soon uh, uh, information on, on that, on different vendors. I cannot really comment directly what is the mm. different vendors power consumption, but uh, this is the basic, there's trade-offs on, on how active the devices are having and how, how much data they have to transmit on the, on the, on the route, but it uh, depends on the, in that sense, in the, in the use case. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So thanks. And then the next question is, can an RD from cluster two route directly to cluster six without going through internet? So going outside the mesh then? With this uh, radio device to radio device routing uh, in in certain area, if they are in locally connected, yes, there's no limitations in that one. But uh, if we think about the uplink traffic, uh, uh, from one device to the back end or, or from the back end to the certain device, then the clusters are independent in that sense. They, the, two device, the two clusters, if they are not in the path of the data, but, uh, but then radio device to radio device between the clusters is possible. Okay, are uplink and downlink messages equal in latency? Uh, not necessarily. We are uh, okay. Goes then, of course, bit on the implementation details of the its protocol and the product. But uh, uh, if we think about the IoT service uh, currently, uh, what we have been seeing, for example, in our use case, what we have been uh, doing earlier, the traffic is heavily uplink oriented, so the routing is currently uplink orient, uh, optimized in that sense. So typically, the, perhaps the latency could be lower in the in the in in uplink direction, and the capacity is higher in the uplink direction. Hmm. But depends on the product again. Okay. Well, in the, uh, sorry. If I continue, individual link, of course. If we think about the star network though, and and the individual transmissions, the latencies are the same. Right. Right. Okay, looking at the time, uh, I think we'll take one more question, which is how are IPv6 to RD addresses resolved? In Ethernet, we have ARP table, and in IPv6, we have neighbor discovery. What is implemented in DEC 2020? So, uh, actually, that is a good question. So, this is something that we are especially addressing now in the release two how the IPv6 addresses are. Uh, uh, let's say auto configured in 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 the in the current. I think currently, uh, so the release two is addressing this this topic exactly how the auto configuration and and this can be uh, uh, handled optimized. Uh, currently, with uh, without let's say with release one implementation, I would assume that the implementators would need to do uh, like a mapping table in the in the in the uh, border routers between the IPv6 and and the and the long, long radio, uh, uh, long radio IDs of, of the system, but uh, the auto addressing is uh, uh, intended to uh, solve in, in, let's say, during next uh, six to nine months in the specification. Thank you, Juho. Now uh, we have still questions popping in, and uh, the list is actually getting longer all the time. So again, <laughs> we will be answering those questions uh, after the meeting. And um, I see now also that people are dropping off because it's uh, past the hour of four. Um, so can you go to the next slide, Juho? So um, I just like to. Uh, say that the next session on the lower layers will be uh, on the 19th of October and of course we'll send out invitations for that. Then we have the last two webinars in the series. They will be held during the DEC Forum uh, World event uh, which is taking place in Munich on 8 and 9 November. Uh, everyone who's interested in NR Plus I would warmly recommend to uh, to participate in, in the DEC World event. Uh, it is free of charge, so you will only have travel and accommodation cost. Um, there will be 
quite a few real experts on NR Plus on site that you can uh, talk with. Uh, and uh, so I warmly recommend you do that. If you're not able to make it, then of course you'll be able to call in uh, as we have done for the other webinars. Um, okay, I think there's one more slide. Yeah, okay, so that's the last one. Uh, again, we hope you uh, enjoyed this webinar today. Um, and if you want to be part of shaping the NR Plus jo journey and join join us, then uh, please do so. You see a link here on the slide, um, uh, and this will explain how you can become a member. Do you, if you have any questions about membership, then don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, my email address is here. Thank you all very much for joining today and look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks. Thank you.